the Colosseum set a new standard for Roman amphitheater design. It contained an intricate network of corridors and staircases that could shuffle 70,000 Romans in and out in record time. As with stadiums today, everyone who entered the Colosseum had a ticket corresponding to the number above one of the entry gates. The complex was designed not only to control the crowds, but to keep them comfortable. It had 110 drinking fountains and two restrooms, large enough to accommodate a packed house. The Colosseum even had a retractable roof. On hot days, an awning called a valerium was unfurled above the upper deck to shade spectators from the sun. It was operated by sailors from the Roman Navy, who were stationed around the top of the Colosseum's arcade. They could move it according to the sun and according to the wind. And subsequently, the Colosseum was amazingly air-conditioned, shaded, and they would stand on top of the arcade and work these poles, the holes of which we can see in the external side, that would hold this immense canvas that would cover the place. By 80 AD, the Colosseum was complete but Vespasian didn't live to see the grand opening of his greatest monument. He had died of natural causes the previous year, so his son and successor, Titus, led the inaugural celebration. For 100 straight days, Romans flocked to the Colosseum to soak in every kind of carnage imaginable. 5,000 animals were slaughtered in a single day, thousands of gladiators and prisoners left as corpses. Outside the arena, bloodshed on this scale was known only in war. But inside, it was pure entertainment. They go for the entire day. And in the morning, they watch men kill or be killed by uh, animals. And around noontime, they're watching the execution of prisoners. And then finally, in the afternoons from the main event, primetime TV kind of experience is the best for last, and that's going to be gladiators, man against man. Gladiatorial fights were a big draw at the Colosseum, but they weren't always the main event. One of the most exhilarating and most exciting shows of the Colosseum was the Numachia, the naval battle. It was a naval battle done with real men aboard real ships, of course fitted accordingly. It would have been entirely possible to have diverted water from one of the aqueducts and brought it to the Colosseum in order to flood the floor to a shallow depth. We do have evidence due to recent studies of the Colosseum that show there are plenty of channels, water channels, for flooding in the substructures of the Colosseum. So yes, it was possible, and yes, it happened. Cristiano Ranieri is the first modern archaeologist to explore the labyrinth of water channels beneath the Colosseum. He believes he has found conclusive evidence of a plumbing system that was used to flood the arena for naval battles. We have found underneath the arena floor some tunnels that are very ancient, even more ancient than the Colosseum, that date from the time of Nero, therefore contemporary to the Domus Aurea. The original water channels built beneath Nero's artificial lake were left intact when the Colosseum was built above it. They could have been reconfigured to flood and drain the arena. In this never-before-seen footage, Cristiano leads his dive team inside those ancient channels and through water polluted with the debris of two millennia. Beneath the Colosseum, he uncovers a holding tank with a direct line to a nearby aqueduct. Cristiano believes water was diverted from that aqueduct into the arena. He also finds evidence of drain pipes that connected to the city sewer system, which could have been used to drain the floodwaters from the arena into the Tiber River. 
There was a proper plumbing system. At one point, the tunnels were used to flood the arena floor to create Navy battle scenes. The Colosseum's naval battles were an astounding engineering triumph, but they proved to be a fleeting trend in the world's most famous arena. Within a decade, flooding operations were abandoned in favor of a renovation that would revolutionize the games. A new two-story substructure beneath the arena called the Hypogeum. Within it were a system of elevators and trap doors that enabled tigers and armed gladiators to suddenly pop up through the floor and slaughter their unsuspecting victims. Although the real spectacle happened up here in the arena, the backbone, the nerve center, the real support system of the arena was down below in the Ipogeum. And there were lion runs, cages for wild animals being taunted. Gladiators sharpening their swords, preparing for death. Condemned criminals in cages. Now, as the games begin, a trap door in the arena floor will open, and by a system of pulleys, an elevator will hoist another lion or panther up into the arena. When the trap door opens, we're bathed in light. We hear the yells of the throng enjoying the games, and then the trap door will close again, leaving us contemplating our own demise amongst the screams and lamentations and stench of blood, beasts, and men. Violent, bloody, exploitative, thrilling. The games in the Colosseum were the ultimate Roman spectacle. And all those who entered were awed by the engineering prowess of the world's most advanced civilization. After a decade of strength and stability under Vespasian, that civilization was reaching the height of its power. And its next generation of rulers would use that power to build ever bigger, ever bolder man-made miracles. By the end of the first century AD, the Roman Empire extended from England to Egypt and from Portugal to Persia. As many as 50 million people of every race and language were loyal subjects of one emperor. That emperor was always an Italian until 98 AD, when an outsider emerged to take over the empire. His name was Trajan, an ambitious warrior from the province of Spain, whose battlefield triumphs had caught the eye of the ailing emperor Nerva. Having no sons of his own, Nerva adopted Trajan as his son and heir. There is a widening of the idea of what it meant to be Roman and who could help the state and who would participate in the state. And Trajan is a very good example of that. Trajan is the first of a whole series of emperors who come from outside of Italy. When Nerva died, Trajan inherited the Roman world. He immediately set out to prove his loyalty to the citizens of the capital. He knew the best way to do this was to appeal to their unyielding sense of supremacy. The Romans thought on a grand scale, the size of their empire, the size of their buildings, and the ambitions of its leading individuals must be one of the things that we point to as defining what it meant to be a Roman. They were driven by, by a kind of collective cultural ego. Trajan launched a massive building campaign that began with the empire's infrastructure. He made urgently needed repairs on roads, harbors, and public buildings. He commissioned one of the last great aqueducts and built new public baths on the crumbling foundations of Nero's golden house. All of this building required a tremendous amount of money. And in order to really complete and fulfill his own kind of plans, he was going to have to come up with a great deal more of it. 
and in Roman terms, this means conquest. In his third year as emperor, Trajan launched a military offensive to raise revenue for the construction of more magnificent monuments. He set out to conquer Dacia, an elusive region encompassing modern Romania and Hungary that had fended off the Romans for centuries. After years of bitter combat, the Dacians surrendered in 107 AD. The conquering emperor plundered hundreds of tons of gold and silver from his new province. Trajan is the emperor that extended the boundaries of the empire to its greatest extent. So Trajan really pushed the envelope, and in doing so, he brought back more money, more goods, more spoils than any other emperor, which meant that he had so much money at his disposal. The emperor spent his new capital on a sprawling public space that would alleviate the congestion in Rome's overcrowded downtown district. Since the beginning of the Republic, the old Roman Forum had been the center of government, commerce, and culture. There, temples to gods like Saturn and Vesta sat beside law courts and libraries. The Forum is important for the Romans because it's their square. It's the place where they meet, where they make deals, where politics are discussed, where objects are sold, where money is exchanged. The Forum is a square filled with life. It's very much alive, like today's a lot more than today's squares, because truly all of the public life took place in the square. But as Rome grew into the capital of the world, development began to sprawl out from its original crossroads. The Forum was a critical part of Roman life, um, but the success of the city and the pressure of the population was such that they had to keep building new extensions time after time. And each emperor, in turn, had to build a new part of the Forum for their own people. By the time of Trajan, Rome was a densely populated metropolis of one million people and growing. So he commissioned his own new Forum, one larger than those of all his predecessors combined. Trajan didn't just have so much money, but the skills of the engineers, the, the people who poured concrete, and so on, they were at a height. They could achieve and create uh, better and faster than any previous time. The man called on to design Trajan's Forum was another outsider, Apollodorus of Damascus. Apollodorus was a Greek architect who had designed military bridges for Trajan during his battles with Dacia. During that war, he had proven to be an architectural mastermind. Now, Apollodorus was faced with a new challenge, a lack of real estate to house Trajan's grand vision. And of course, as in modern day buildings, location is absolutely critical. So if an emperor wanted to build a structure in a particular location and, uh, and they had to level the site, then they would just have to do that. To create a flat plain large enough to develop in downtown Rome, Apollodorus ordered his builders to carve out a huge chunk of the Quirinal Hill adjacent to the old forum. We're living in a time thousands of years before dynamite. The Romans had to achieve these great feats of terraforming and clearing the landscape through sheer manpower, uh, the force of tens of thousands of slaves working around the clock with shovels and pickaxes. Imagine an army of ants carrying away a loaf of bread. They're not going to do it all in once. They're going to break it apart into small pieces and take it apart one at a time. An army of Roman slaves methodically leveled the stone hillside, chipping away 125 feet of elevation and generating over 600,000 square feet of prime real estate in the heart of Rome. There, a city of marble began to rise from the soil as a Spanish emperor and a Greek architect remade the capital. The finished product was unveiled in 112 AD.
Trajan's Forum was a magnificent marble network of Greek and Latin libraries, colossal statues, an enormous central piazza, and a two-story basilica where laws were made and cases tried. To go to the Forum of Trajan would have been a massive experience for any Roman. He would have entered the Basilica, the largest ever built in Rome of that type. The Basilica was revetted with marble, flooded with light. After that, you would have arrived in the square. You would have looked around and seen the monumental equestrian statue of Trajan. It really must have been an awesome sight. The Forum's centerpiece was a 125-foot marble column that towered above the new construction. That column still survives today. Around its facade, a spiraling relief is carved that tells the story of Trajan's invasion of Dacia. Trajan appears over and over and over and over again. Uh, always involved in every aspect of the campaign, from its initial planning all the way through final conquest. And in this way, the column serves as a kind of uh, propaganda film. The column's exact height holds a more subtle significance. The height of Trajan's column itself, 100 feet, with the addition of the base and the statue on top of that, marked the height of the side of the Quirinal Hill, which was removed to create the forum at that spot. Therefore, it becomes a marker not only of the battles of Trajan, but also the battles of Apollodorus to clear the land and create this monumental urban space. Trajan's forum stood for 700 years. Most of it was reduced to rubble by a 9th century earthquake. But there is one surviving section that leaves no doubt about its imposing scale, a vast complex known as Trajan's Market. Apollodora shored up the 125-foot cliff face he had created by form-fitting a six-story Roman shopping mall directly into the hillside. He ingeniously shaped the first three levels in a hemicycle, a semicircular structure with long, curved corridors of storefronts. The markets function to reinforce the hillside, which had just been carved out. It's probably not um, by chance that the form that's used against that hillside is concave, therefore a much stronger form, again, the form of an arch turned on its side to resist the pressure of the hill beside that. Above the hemicycle were three more levels, with units ranging from small shops to great three-storied halls. Trajan's market contained over 150 individual storefronts that might have supplied everything from footwear to fine art. These markets must have sold uh, enormous quantities of materials from all parts of the Roman world and perhaps even beyond. While Trajan's forum next door was a lavish haven for the city's elite, his market was engineered as a main street for the masses. The market, together with the Forum, represent two sides of Roman culture. The opulence of the Forum, its colonnaded forecourt, its uh, gilded decorations, uh, represented a tremendous formal center for the city. Right next to that, the brick architecture of the marketplace, very commonplace in the city for the daily lives of the Roman citizenry. Trajan's engineering feats at home and conquests abroad made him one of the most popular emperors in Roman history. He was a great constructor, as well as being a great strategist. And just like Augustus, he assured a period of peace and tranquility, which was very important for the empire. But defending more territory would prove problematic for Trajan's successor. So to stabilize the empire's borders, Rome's next emperor would build a massive barricade to seal off the Roman world from the barbarians beyond. By the time he died in 117 AD, Emperor Trajan had propelled the Roman Empire to the height of its size and wealth. But the drawbacks of such a widespread dominion 
would soon become evident. Trajan had no biological sons, so upon his death, control of the empire passed to his adoptive son, Hadrian. Hadrian, like Trajan, was a military man and an accomplished one. Hadrian saw that the empire would be unable to maintain its expanded borders. The longer the borders are extended, of course, the more money it takes to be able to maintain um, border defenses. So he wasn't looking for more things to conquer, but how to hold on to what they already had. Concrete evidence of Hadrian's defensive policy shift can be found today in a remote section of northern England, 1,500 miles from Rome. When Hadrian came to power in 117, the northern half of Britannia remained an untamed frontier, where Roman soldiers confronted the dual threats of freezing winters and barbarian incursion. So in 122 AD, Hadrian paid a personal visit to the front lines. The emperor quickly concluded that the only way to tame Britannia was to tame his own soldiers first. The Romans always believed it. You have this group of men who are serving the Roman state, make them work. If you're not disciplined, the thought is these Roman soldiers are just gonna start frittering away their time and gambling and not doing the right thing. Hadrian put his legions to work on the most ambitious fortification ever conceived by a Roman. A towering 73-mile defensive wall across the entire country. Today, the pilfering of time has reduced Hadrian's wall to its foundations. But it once towered 15 feet high with parapets rising an additional six feet above that. A nine-foot ditch was dug at its base, forcing potential invaders to make a 30-foot climb before coming face to face with the Roman legions on the other side. And if invaders did miraculously make it over the wall and pass the Roman guards, they had one last obstacle to slow their advance, the vallum, a 120-foot wide ditch that ran behind the wall from coast to coast. Hadrian's Wall was as much a psychological barrier as a physical one. Its monstrous, unending facade served as an unnerving reminder of Rome's indisputable dominance. In some ways, you might be able to compare Hadrian's Wall to the Berlin Wall. And that is a wall that's intended both to keep people out and to keep people in and to prevent a kind of uh, mixing that goes uncontrolled. Hadrian's Great Divide would be the Roman world's largest stone fortification. One made all the more challenging and effective by northern Britannia's jagged terrain. The difficulties were enormous because the ground is extremely uneven. There are cliffs, valleys, rock walls, so even this was a work of great engineering, of great benefit, and of great practicality because this way they were able to reduce the number of garrisons defending the border. Three legions, totaling between 15 and 25,000 men, were needed to undertake the back-breaking task of moving heavy stone blocks to the construction site. But the wall was only one component of Hadrian's grand design. Every Roman mile, the legions built a guard post into the wall called a mile castle which housed up to 60 troops at a time. Between each mile castle stood two smaller watchtowers, where sentries kept a constant eye on the borderland. And along the length of the wall, 17 enormous superforts were built that could house a thousand Roman soldiers. 
what this in effect did was kind of create a military zone that allowed the Romans to maintain enough military strength right along the wall to go out in force, patrol along the front, conduct maintenance, and still maintain the kind of military presence that was effective as well as impressive. Each superfort covered three to five acres and included an assembly hall, a temple, barracks, hospital, and bathhouse, everything needed to sustain an army. Around these forts, towns sprung up to satisfy the army's constant demand for food and supplies. These Roman troops wanted Roman shoes. They wanted Roman needles. They wanted all the things that they could have um, elsewhere in the Roman world. So trade tends to follow them. Bars tend to follow them. Women tend to follow them and end up changing fundamentally the areas in which they are um, settled. In just five years, Hadrian's vast barrier across Britain was complete. The emperor had secured Rome's northwest border, improved discipline within his ranks, and created an unmistakable testament to the vast reach of Roman power. In 126 AD, Hadrian returned to Rome. There, he would commission one of Rome's most celebrated engineering marvels and eliminate its most celebrated engineer. In 126 AD, Emperor Hadrian returned to Rome after a five-year military inspection tour on the Roman frontier. While he was away, his builders had been working feverishly to carry out his architectural vision in the capital city. Hadrian certainly wanted to leave an imprint on Rome. He wanted to um, revive Augustine building and show that he could do better. 150 years earlier, Emperor Augustus had famously transformed Rome from a city of brick into a city of marble. Hadrian wanted his own building legacy to be equally memorable, and the crown jewel in that legacy would have a direct link to the reign of his legendary predecessor. Soon after he became emperor, he set his sights on rebuilding a burned out temple complex dating from the time of Augustus. In the rubble of the old ruin, he commissioned his most famous structure, the Pantheon, a majestic temple to the Roman gods. The Pantheon is arguably the most amazing structure ever built by the Romans. Why? The rotunda. The rotunda, a huge interior space capped by a magnificent dome ceiling, was the heart of the Pantheon's design. At its center, the concrete dome rises nearly 150 feet. It spans exactly the same length across without any support from columns or buttresses. 150 feet is a great distance to span. And the guts that they had to attempt something so wide, to span something so wide, this is one of the grand achievements. The Pantheon's dome would remain the largest unsupported concrete span in the world for 18 centuries. Before Hadrian's engineers could start pouring the dome's concrete ceiling, they needed to figure out how to direct its weight away from its center. Otherwise, when they removed the wooden framework holding the ceiling in place, 3,000 tons of concrete would collapse under its own weight. Today, when we build in concrete, we introduce a steel tension rod, which picks up half of the stresses in the concrete. The Romans couldn't do this. Therefore, the dome of the Pantheon was constantly pushing outward towards its base. The Pantheon's engineers developed several radical solutions to make sure its ceiling and the emperor's reputation wouldn't come crashing down. First, they built a solid base of walls 20 feet thick to act as a foundation for the ceiling. 
So they used the vertical walls on either side to help support the weight of the dome from pushing outwards. They used the walls to buttress the dome itself. Next, as the ceiling rose toward its apex, they mixed in lighter materials with the cement and poured a progressively thinner layer of it. Roman concrete, like concrete today, used aggregate, usually stones, to bond the concrete together. Uh, in the Pantheon's dome, Romans used a common technique at that time of actually inserting hollow amphora or jugs inside of the concrete to displace some of the concrete and lighten the load. To make the ceiling even lighter, the builders molded recessed panels called coffers into the ceiling, which served two ingenious purposes. These coffers are meant, obviously, for an aesthetic uh, purpose, that is that they um, allow the a surface of the domed area to be decorated, uh, but at the same time, they reduce the amount of concrete which is necessary uh, for the dome itself. A final weight-shedding alteration immediately became the Pantheon's most distinctive feature, the oculus a 30-foot-wide hole in the center of the ceiling. The oculus eliminates the stress of heavy concrete at the dome's weakest point, and it lights up the interior like the sun does the earth. Imagine as an ancient, uh, never having been in this kind of interior space before, because no, no other interior space had ever looked like it before, uh, feeling um, the religious aspect of the interior itself. Um, a building which was dedicated to all the gods. The Pantheon's engineers strove for perfection and almost achieved it. But there is one mysterious flaw in the design that still baffles modern observers. The Pantheon's front portico, the colonnaded gateway to the interior, is about 10 feet too short doesn't connect with the rotunda where it should. Why 50-foot columns were not used instead of the 40s that were there can only be held to speculation at this point. Did they sink in the Mediterranean? Um, were the Romans not able to acquire the stone to achieve uh, those kind of columns in the time necessary for Hadrian to inaugurate the building? We can't say for sure. For centuries, the Pantheon has stood as a confounding engineering enigma. But the way it was built is just part of the puzzle. The bigger mystery is who designed it. There are no surviving records to reveal the architect's identity. But modern speculation centers on Emperor Hadrian himself. He was a very versatile individual and painted and wrote poetry and, and loved architecture. So many of Hadrian's other buildings were domes. So it seems to me that Hadrian may have had a hand in the design. Another potential candidate is Apollodorus of Damascus, the genius behind the forum built by Hadrian's predecessor, Trajan. Apollodorus was skeptical of Hadrian's architectural skills and bold enough to declare it publicly. Apollodorus at one point sneers at Hadrian and says, go off and design your pumpkin domes. Well, the project was given to Apollodorus, but he didn't want to implement some of the changes suggested by Hadrian. And so probably for this reason, Hadrian had him killed you know, forced him to kill himself. In 138 AD, eight years after ordering the death of Rome's greatest architect, Hadrian himself died of natural causes at the age of 62. His two decades in power had been one of the most prolific periods of construction in Roman history. By the time of his death, harbors, temples, Bridges and basilicas in every corner of the empire bore his name. It would be nearly a century before another emperor would commission one of Rome's last great engineering achievements, 
and send the empire spiraling towards self-destruction. In the decades following Hadrian's death, the Roman Empire remained the dominant force in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Its emperors maintained absolute authority. Its armies remained invincible and its architects continued to inspire jaw-dropping awe. Their crowning achievement, a behemoth complex of Roman baths, was commissioned in 212 AD by a corrupt power monger named Caracalla. He rose to power the old-fashioned way, through murder. Caracalla's late father, Emperor Septimius Severus, had wanted his two sons to rule the Roman Empire together. But Caracalla and his brother Geta hated each other. After their father's death, it was only a matter of time before one eliminated the other. Caracalla struck first. Caracalla had him killed right in front of his mother, which seems to me a horrible, horrible thing. Geta's name was erased from memory, not only from inscriptions, but Geta's image was chiseled out. They erased the name, but they leave the erasure. We know that the state has taken um, steps to eradicate him, and we should remember that lesson. During the reign of Caracalla, blood once again flowed through the imperial chambers and the empire was back in the hands of a tyrant who ruled by fear. The rule of Caracalla is characterized by that of a man, emperor, who places himself above man, within the sphere of the gods. Caracalla wanted to leave a legacy that would secure his fame for the ages. As the Colosseum had for Vespasian, the Forum for Trajan, and the Pantheon for Hadrian. He had to prove himself as worthy of the imperial power. He had to show that he was even better than his father. The new emperor would attempt to cleanse his past sins by building a bath complex. For centuries, baths had been an integral part of daily life in Rome. They centered around an arrangement of hot and cold pools. But the baths were more than just a place to bathe. They were country clubs open to people of every class. Everyone attended the baths. The young, the old, the rich, and the poor, often with great freedom and promiscuity. Perhaps promiscuity couldn't be applied to both sexes, because there were different times for female and male attendance. The baths were the meeting place of the entire population, because above all, they were free. You didn't have to pay to go to the baths. After you finished work, you're going to go to the baths for a couple of hours to unwind, to listen to politics, to, to get a rub down, to have a manicure, to have a haircut. There were places to work out. You could wrestle. And then, of course, you could go to the baths themselves and go to the hot rooms, sweat a lot. And you were surrounded by magnificent structures that were sheathed in marble and decorated with statues and they were for the benefit of the average person. This was not just a structure for the rich, this was for the average Roman citizen. Baths had always been a popular construction project among Roman emperors. Previous rulers like Nero, Titus, and Trajan had each built extravagant baths in their own name. And Caracalla was determined to trump them all with the most massive bath complex ever built. The imposing shell that remains today is a testament to his success. As you can see from 
what remains all around us, there was a series of giant rooms in which there were swimming pools the size of Olympic pools. There were bathing pools at different temperatures, private bathing rooms, and areas where people could mix and mingle. The central building was larger than St. Peter's Basilica and trimmed from stem to stern in gold and marble. Its floors were covered with intricate mosaics, fragments of which still remain. Surrounding the main building were open spaces for track and field events, separate buildings containing libraries, shops, restaurants, and even brothels lined the perimeter. The complex could comfortably accommodate nearly 2,000 Romans at a time. This small town would have been heaving with people every day. These enormous rooms are a testament to the engineering and skill of the people who built it. They surpassed any of the baths that had been built previously. Caracalla's laborers worked overtime to complete his baths quickly. To build such a magnificent bathing facility in five years, there would have been between five and 10,000 people working daily for five years straight. The buildings seen above ground were just half of the story. Beneath the complex, a water channel tunneled from a nearby aqueduct diverted five million gallons of fresh water into the baths every day. The baths were a miracle of hydraulic engineering, with the frigidarium, tepidarium, and caladarium, that with their different grades in temperature of the water, as well as the environment, allowed the creation of a climate of well-being for the patrons. Water for the hot pools was diverted to furnaces where it was heated over wood fires. As many as 50 such furnaces were built directly beneath the floor. This floor literally divided the world of the wealthy and successful Roman citizen from the underworld of slaves and laborers who were toiling away in furnace-like conditions, stoking fires and, and choked with smoke and fumes and, and so on. Up here in these beautifully decorated chambers with marbles and mosaics and decorated tiled ceilings. It must have seemed like paradise. The Baths of Caracalla opened in 216 AD. They were one of the last great feats of Roman engineering, combining all the skills the Romans had perfected over the centuries. In a bath complex like that of Caracalla, a lot of great achievements of Roman engineering come together. The production of bricks, masonry, the import of marble. You have the long tradition that the Romans have in building water systems, aqueducts, but also drainage and sewer systems. You have also their long experience in the use of concrete, which allows them to create big spaces that they can cover with vast spanning domes and vaults. Caracalla's baths were an amazing success, but the same couldn't be said for his reign. While his pet project strained the Roman economy, Caracalla hemorrhaged more cash on costly invasions of Parthia and Armenia eastern regions not controlled by a Roman emperor since Trajan a century earlier. Like Trajan, Caracalla had hoped to cement his legacy through conquest. Instead, he sealed his own fate. In 217 AD, after a six-year reign of cruelty and intimidation, Caracalla was stabbed to death by his own guards during an Eastern military campaign. That same year, a devastating fire gutted the Colosseum and the soul of the capital. The amphitheater would be rebuilt 20 years later, but the empire itself would never recover. The glory days of Augustus, Vespasian, and Trajan were long gone, and they would never return. 
Over the next three centuries, the empire that had once burned so brightly slowly burned out. The theories as to why fill volumes. Some people say it is the metallurgy that poisoned them. Some people say it is the decadence and the inbreeding in the upper class. Some people say it is the lack of a trained army and subsequently no defense. I think the Roman Empire was simply too large to be governed effectively, to be administered, and to create any kind of real sense of community. In the 5th and 6th centuries, Germanic warrior tribes repeatedly sacked Rome, demanding land and money. In 537, an invading tribe went right for the jugular, destroying the city's most vital life-sustaining arteries, its aqueducts. Without the running water its citizens had come to rely on, the once great capital crumbled. People without water couldn't live in the city center. The gardens and farmlands could not be watered. The population of 1.2 million people quickly dwindled to 12,000. That's a 99% decrease. 1,500 years after the fall of Rome, its engineering legacy still inspires and confounds modern builders. So many of the things that the Romans uh, were able to do in their time, we were not able to do again until we developed new technologies. We wouldn't be able to accomplish a dome like the Pantheon without the use of a computer, certainly. We wouldn't be able to move a hillside without mechanized equipment. Given their tools, we would never be able to accomplish those same things. Maybe the most important lesson the Romans taught us is one that Julius Caesar, Nero, and Caracalla never understood. That the same blind ambition that drives our progress can also bring about our demise. These people lived out their ambitions and their kind of appetites in such a way that we both admire them and kind of abhor them at the same time. The ancient Romans were often violent, vindictive, greedy, and egocentric. But the imposing structures they left behind stand as evidence not only of the power of one civilization, but of the unlimited potential of humankind.